Stanford University.
just to get us through the next day. We have had, I'm going to show you two examples of multiple large scale vasodilator trials built on arguably limited basic evidence to support the mechanisms of action, which have been conducted, uh, in this case, the vasodilator loratitide, um, that have shown no advantage in improving outcomes. The next one uh, um, kind of resets. This was, uh, again, both of these, by the way, suggested some benefit in early phase trials. Um, uh, and in both cases, here was relaxin, um, uh, uh, which I, it had a good story behind it. No difference. So we have, on multiple occasions, I'm only using two of these examples, um, uh, have tried to focus on the acute presentation and modify hemodynamics and modify filling pressures acutely um, without any goals of long-term continuation of therapy, because these were all acute uh, administrations of drugs, with no, no impact on long-term outcome, even short-term outcome up to 180 days. And so I and others, uh, and if you want a good read, uh, it's always good to read Milton Packer, because he always can put things uh, in a very, uh, highlight things in a certain way. You know, I think the mis we've misplaced our uh, focus on the acute in acute decompensated heart failure, that we can't start something that we don't know how it works in a population that I'm going to share with you, we really can't even well phenotype and expect any difference in outcomes like, uh, than what we've shown before. So there's been a graveyard, and I will take full credit. I've been part of this, uh, uh, this grave. I've, 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 uh, I've dug a lot of graves myself uh, of phase three pharmacological trials looking at different strategies of vasodilation or increasing inotropes, uh, increasing inotropy that have um, been failures, um, uh, really have made no impact on, uh, on what we're doing with these patients. And I would argue, and this is just a very nice review, um, I've really tried to pull recent uh, work from, uh, from some of my partners, uh, old partners, um, that has just done a, a, a analysis of the different ways that we as clinician investigators uh, uh, qualify patients. I mean, we have many different scores. We have a plethora of these different profiles that we think we use maybe clinically as, uh, 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 to make our lives easier when we approach a patient, uh, and that we have tried to um, put different patients in different bins expecting that they might be treated differently. And, uh, and I, you're not supposed to be able to read any of this. There's, there's, this is just one of several pages of these. Um, but at the end, and this is going to go to the guidelines that were published this weekend that I'm going to refer you to, this is kind of where we are as an organization uh, of, of clinicians. We basically look at congestion. And we look at perfusion. We try to use the best of our abilities clinically uh, to put people into these quadrants of warm and dry, or warm and wet, or cold and dry and cold and wet. Many of you who've been around for a while recognize that this is not any, anything new. This is, was described by Thomas Killip in looking at MI patients you know, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and uh, we kind of put them in terms of, uh, uh, we try to define where their congestion resides, be it a left-sided or right-sided congestion. This is the state of the art in the, guide, in the consensus document that was published this weekend from the ACHA. This is what we, in this day and age, with all the science that we have available to us, are doing to put people into quadrants to uh, assign therapy. And we know, even though this is very basic, that based on these uh, cold and dry, warm and wet uh, uh, different profiles, that patients end up in different places based on how, they're, how they are identified. And so you're more likely to be, uh, uh, be put in an intensive care unit if you're cold and dry, which suggests hyperperfusion and, uh, and, and congestion, um, I'm sorry, cold and wet. Uh, and you're less likely, and you're more likely to be discharged from the hospital and the ED, from the ED if you uh, have uh, 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 no evidence of hyperfusion or congestion. So they have some clinical relevance because we apply these uh, 
uh, uh, heuristics uh, to the way we treat um, patients. And they have some relevance in terms of uh, uh, what happens to these patients. And you can see that you know, the base case being no perfusion uh, abnormalities, no congestion abnormalities versus patients who are congested and hyperperfused, that you can see their uh, hazard ratios uh, differ. So there's some relevance to this, but I, I, I hope you all would agree with me that this is quite crude. This is based on uh, over 10,000 patients presenting to 41 hospitals uh, uh, in Spain. Uh, and it's one of the better uh, analyses and registries of this kind of uh, assessment. And, uh, and you can see what happens to these patients uh, and outcomes uh, from this work uh, in terms of being readmitted, uh, prolonging and hospitalization. Again, some uh, relative relationship between these clinical profiles and outcomes. But what we're also learning is that is not even close to the end of the story, that we have, um, uh, now I just put all these papers up, some of them done by some of my uh, colleagues and some of my mentors, uh, mentees, I'm sorry, that have started to apply different unsupervised or supervised learning algorithms to take advantage of computational uh, 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 strategies to identify cohorts and, uh, that can perhaps do a better job at defining uh, what, uh, how these patients, uh, how similar patients are to each other, and how similar they are, uh, how those patient groups could be related to outcomes, with the goal again that if we could potentially phenotype these patients more effectively, we can apply these uh, therapies that we've developed <coughs> that failed when we put them all in the same group under the same umbrella, and we can apply them more effectively uh, into the future. And what's interesting is when you apply these. Uh, this is one, you know, uh, clustering algorithm that's been applied uh, that I find very uh, interesting uh, to data from a very highly well phenotyped population of patients that Bob uh, Harrington and I were involved in, in supporting uh, uh, the, from the ESCAPE trial. You see it's all over the place. There is no relationship, unfortunately, between these clinical profiles of dry, warm, wet, warm, dry, cold, wet, cold, and actually um, uh, the, the clusters that were defined by outcomes. Um, and so uh, the clinical profile and patient clusters seem to be unmatched. So to me, what this tells me, is there's a lot of data, there's a lot of information out there that we don't know about, and we don't know how to integrate that information into how we deliver care. And that may be at the heart of the problem, uh, a little bit of why we're getting the outcomes we're getting. So I mentioned these two consensus statements that I think summarize um, the state of the knowledge. Uh, you should read them. They're very valuable. They were just published uh, last week, this 2019 AC expert consensus decision pathway. Um, but I think the point that I want to make from these is that this is, these should be, um, when you review them, you, 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 I am left with, wow, we really don't know very much. That's kind of... That's my takeaway, is we are still in the dark ages a little bit about how we approach one of the most important uh, uh, healthcare problems of our age. So I've approached, um, I've tried to go back to basics, and I've actually pursued my investigations to try to answer, again, simple questions that might do, uh, might be able to perhaps reduce the heterogeneity that we see among outcomes, but perhaps are not really focused on the, uh, the actual biological basis of that. Uh, because I think we do need to learn, hopefully, with colleagues who are at the point of, uh, of, in, of, of fundamental biology, more about what are, uh, what are we capturing in these unsupervised machine learning algorithms that we don't capture clinically and apply it. Um, so I'm focusing on two areas. And I'm going to talk about optimizing volume status and optimizing chronic oral therapy because they're just uh, examples of my own work. So this is a cartoon that, that <coughs> describes the clinical course of a patient presenting with acute heart failure and the opportunities that we as clinicians um, have to interact with them and make decisions and where the nodes of those decisions are. So there's obviously the admission point where there's acute decompensation um, and, and there needs to be rapid hemodynamic stability achieved um, and hopefully decongestion. And then you start getting into issues around how to transition a patient from that process of being hemodynamically unstable and congested 
to a, pl a point where they can they start planning for discharge. Um, and then how do we use that hospital time to transition patients effectively to the right therapies that make an outcome difference long term? And how should we follow these patients to minimize uh, variability in those outcomes of discharge? This is a nice structure that kind of gives you a sense of the different decision points that we are, take, we are uh, approaching in these patients. Again, the most common cause of hospitalization for the Medicare population in the U.S. And so the central role of decongestion is, it, it should be highlighted. I mean, you know, and we, you know, have some clinical tools, not a lot, um, not very sophisticated, but some clinical tools that n help us put people on this, uh, this path between true decongestion and the absence of any evidence of, of ventricular pressure overload uh, and atrial pressure overload. And, uh, and congestion where patients are obviously an extremis. And we then evaluate where people are on this, you know, uh, on this uh, uh, path and continuum. And we make some decisions around uh, escalating different therapies to allow time to decongest and, and better perfuse vital organs. Uh, or we are making enough progress and then we can move them towards uh, oral therapies and, uh, uh, and discharge. Um, so our decongest, do we know how to do this? Do we know how to decongest patients? This is a very simple question, um, a question that actually um, was a, a thematic one that we in the Heart Failure Network uh, uh, approached when we first got funded in 2006. So for those of you who don't know about this, maybe you heard it from Adrian when he visited, that Adrian's the current lead of this, is in 2006, myself and Kerry Lee, uh, under support of, of, uh, uh, of our organization, DCRI, were able to bring the coordinating center for the Heart Failure Network, which is a new concept of bringing nine or 10 like-minded nodes, regional nodes of excellence for heart failure care together with a coordinating center to ask the questions that industry was not gonna ask, that are, were critical to, to, the, to the care of these patients. And the one theme that we approached was, gosh, we do this every day. We give patients loop diuretics every day, and we don't know how to do it. We've never really tested it. We've never really evaluated if we do it this way versus that way with facilitated support from other medications that we might get different outcomes. And so this was really my era. I was kind of Heart Failure Network 1.0, and Dr. Hernandez uh, took the leadership role in, to, in, in the next iteration, was can we do some simple, not so simple, it ended up being uh, trials to ask these questions that are at the heart of our day-to-day -day activities with heart failure patients, but which we don't have an answer. One of them was, how do we deliver <clears throat> loop diuretics intravenously? Do we give it as a bolus uh, uh, based on the pharmacodynamics, <clears throat> or do we give it to them as continuous infusions? Um, do we use a low dose or a high dose uh, strategy? Um, these are very simple, basic questions. Um, and I could ask, we, what we did was we actually asked um, a, uh, a survey of, of uh, what we consider experts in heart failure care. <clears throat> and it was remarkable, the amount of heterogeneity and how people give this simple drug, because everyone has their own you know, mechanism and heuristic. Um, I frankly will be very frank. I used to give a lot of continuous infusion diure diuretics. Bob may remember this. I would bring people in and I would say, I, I, had, a, I had evidence that I thought supported um, that plan, but I didn't have the kind of evidence I needed. <clears throat> in the end of the day, it really wasn't a difference. It didn't matter how you got there. It, uh, it, it, it basically, there was maybe a slight suggestion of an improvement when you targeted high, high doses of, of uh, diuretics versus lower doses. But if you gave it continuously or by bolus, it didn't matter. <clears throat> now, you say this is a negative result. But actually, this is a very important result because Velasquez stopped giving continuous infusion diuretics. And that meant that the patients could get up out of the bed and walk more uh, because they weren't tied to um, a, a uh, infusion pump. And the cost of delivering that care in hospital 
obviously re is reduced. So there are downstream effects of these kind of questions, even though we might not meet our primary goal of uh, our hypothesis. Then we did some work in the cardiorenal syndrome, which arguably, I'm not even sure what it is anymore, because we, had, we, were, we felt very strongly that we knew that there was this population out there where they were congested and they were, they had progressive renal hyperperfusion and worsening renal function as measured by markers of kidney uh, uh, function like creatinine. And we had new tools, toolkits, uh, new, 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 uh, uh, new toys like ultrafiltration uh, mechanisms that we can kind of bring people to the ultrafiltration machine and they could just continuously remove uh, 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 volume at a lower rate uh, with, less, uh, with less potentially uh, sodium uh, and, and electrolyte disturbances. And there was a lot of nice evidence supporting the mechanism, but no one had ever looked at the impact on, on outcomes to this level. So we asked a question, are we more likely to meet this bivariate goal of improving uh, weight loss, in decongesting patients, while maintaining kidney function at the same level or better? And the answer was, we could use this expensive toy, um, and we might think we're doing something different for our patients, but in the end, there was no evidence that that was the case based on this, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, trial. And, um, and this arguably changed uh, the, the direction of this field um, and reset it uh, from a perspective of being something that was being uh, applied increasingly um, to one where there was inc there was a little bit more reticence in using it, and there was a need for better uh, better information. And then maybe my favorite published uh, um, uh, these were one, two, and three year after year um, uh, was uh, the Rose trial, where we actually asked a question around do we facilitate uh, uh, decongestion with uh, uh, vasodilators or isotope strategies, the serotide being available and ha being highly used at the time um, uh, before safety concerns were raised in a larger trial called Ascend, um, and dopamine. Just a simple factorial design asking a very simple question. At that time and still today, dopamine is used based on where you are and who you are giving treatment. And you don't, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in what systems do relating to the use of dopamine to support or facilitate effective decongestion in patients who present with acute heart failure. <clears throat> and here's the outcome. Uh, there was no evidence of a benefit uh, in favor of dopamine. Again, this is a value added. This is a reduction in, a, in an expensive therapy that has no particular purpose, it seemed like, from our data. And actually, there was evidence that was, again, supportive of what we eventually found was the ASCEND program that Nasiratide had, there was a risk associated with that strategy in these patients. And so, you know, important NIH-funded programs um, that necessarily didn't give us new therapies, but evaluate how we were applying current strategies uh, in, in these patients. So at the end of the day, here we're back to this guideline. And we're, this is what, this is how you, they were told, based on a guideline, a consensus document, how we should use the IV diuretics. We kind of do this. We say we double the dose. We wait for some evidence of, of, of improvement. And then we uh, escalate uh, or, or discontinue uh, drugs accordingly. We, we, we're not, we don't have an answer. We just know that other things that were becoming uh, fashionable, perhaps, were not uh, really effective. So then, what about outpatient decongestion? This is my latest kick, and I don't know if Bob knows about this program. Um, that, uh, so I also got a little frustrated, um, and Joe mentioned that I'm kind of a student of, of pa pathways towards evidence. And the network model is a very, was a very frustrating model for me. I don't know if we got as much done as quickly as possible as we should have. And we spent a fair bit of money that may have been uh, uh, aligned to other resources. And I wanted to do more basic investigation alongside our clinical pragmatic trials. We weren't really truly pragmatic in the network. And I think we've learned from that. So I, I was very interested in what do we do? How do we apply diuretics in the outpatient strategy when we discharge patients? Again, we use 90%, 92% of the time, we use the loop diuretic furosemide. 
which was first to the market and the first generic. And we have others available which might have different outcomes. And so some meta-analyses, this was done by my current colleagues, um, um, suggested that even though small trials have been done when, when torsamide was brought to market, and torsamide had a very different pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic profile, different, uh, different effects on fibrosis, and, and a, a very strong a basic uh, biology behind differences against furosemide, that still 92% of the time we were using furosemide. And we didn't really, uh, and we had this suggestion that there might be in a meta-analysis uh, a need to revisit that standard of furosemide. And so I kind of went with the concept that I want to finally build a pragmatic trial network to randomize patients very quickly um, uh, in a clinically relevant manner with reduced burden to sites and wanted to pull this all together into a question I thought was a simple one, which was what was the germination for this program called TRANSFORM, uh, which is currently funded um, uh, and is a partnership between a clinical coordinating center that I lead with now my now former colleague uh, and mentee, but now partner, Rob Mentz, uh, and uh, Kevin Anstrom, uh, um, who is a data coordinating center, uh, uh, and Eric Eisenstein at the data coordinating center. So this is a 6,000 patient pragmatic trial, open label, because these, these drugs are both generic. And we're randomizing them one-to-one to, -one to torsamide or furosemide, where the work of randomization is in the hospital. When that ends, the patients go home, and we use uh, electronic mechanisms as well as a call center uh, to follow patients uh, in a uh, in what is a, a, a less burdensome manner, uh, which uh, has I think led to some improvement in our ability to enroll uh, certain certain types of patients uh, who might not want to be part of clinical trials that are more burdensome. Looking at all cause mortality and uh, uh, several uh, important uh, quality of life endpoints, which we're managing through the call center uh, follow up. This is enrolled over 1,100 patients, and the time uh, that the average site is enrolled in almost three patients per month. The other trials in the network that I showed you, plus all the other trials that I showed you as well in heart failure, in the most common disease in the US in the hospital, was enrolling 0.2 to 0.3 patients a month. So we have logarithmically changed enrollment rates by trying to develop a pragmatic open level design and using um, the, lever the leveraging the health system uh, a construct of data uh, in a different way. And this is costing the NIH much, much less money, roughly about $1,000 per patient. Um, um, so why would we do such a simple trial? This is, this is basic. You know, this is why. So this is the calculation that Erica Eisenstein developed that if we just went from a 90% penetrance of furosemide and our hypothesis that torsemide is better, and all we did was switch people from 90% use to 50% use, not even 100% use, just let's say we show you torsemide is better and we go from 90% to 50%, the impact on the US healthcare system would be massive. Okay, this would fund many R1s uh, and many other things. Um, and so these are simple questions, um, small changes, which could have a big impact uh, if we could better understand how we deliver medications that we deliver every day. Um, so let me then talk now about optimizing chronic oral therapy. So this is a data that um, one of our fellows, uh, Steve Green, has put out, and it's a, a really beautiful analysis of uh, of, uh, of uh, the CHAMP registry, um, large uh, uh, heart failure registry in the US. And it's, it's a little bit um, so sobering. We have had evidence for decades that these classes of agents, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and mineral cortical receptor antagonists, the first trial of mineral cortical receptor antagonists, the, the RALS trial, is 20 years old that showed a benefit in terms of mortality if we use that in heart failure. So these have been around a long time. And we know that in day-to-day -day practice right now, we're not using these drugs. 39% of the population that is eligible is not receiving an ACE inhibitor, 32%, almost 33%, not a beta blocker, and 66% in the US, for some reason the US has a hard time with mineral cortical receptor antagonists compared to our European colleagues, uh, are not using MRAs. So really tremendous opportunity for improvement. Um, 
and it's really unacceptably low based on the, uh, uh, and this may explain some of the heterogeneity that I showed you in that heat map in the US. Um, so what do we know about starting in hospital, these medications? We know from data that was done by uh, our partners, uh, Wendy used to have our office next to me. Uh, she was a farm D on my heart failure service that we helped create. Uh, studies like this that said, well, if we start inpatient carvedilol, the likelihood that patients will be on outpatient carvedilol is much higher. Simple comment concept, but something that we've seen now with multiple different strategies. We learned also from the optimized heart failure registry that by deciding to start a drug in hospital, and which is going to likely mean that they're going to actually be on that drug as an outpatient and be adherent to it as an outpatient, you're more likely to have an impact on an outcome at a short time, like 90 days. So that decision of not just leaving it for the outpatient, but just taking responsibility to put people on guideline-directed medical therapy in the transition point has an impact even in 90 days um, in, with beta blockers. So I applied that construct to new emerging data with angiotensin receptor nepolysin inhibition, uh, ARNIs. And this is the, the landmark trial that led to uh, re registration of uh, uh, scuroval-sardin, which was at that time called LCZ696, uh, and showed against a, uh, not a placebo, but a, 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 a standard of care medication that in chronic heart failure patients towards a 20% relative risk reduction, which was about a five, almost 5% 5 absolute risk reduction uh, over about a median of 25 months if you took patients with reduced ejection fraction, and you gave them this medicine versus the standard in Alpril. So there's a change, it's just a, a change in how we practice medicine. Um, and what we learned was that if we, in stable outpatients with reduced EF, who are already tolerating high doses of ACE inhibitors, paradigm said, said if you switch patients from an Alpril, for example, to Cibrilvalsarin, you avoided 47 primary endpoints of CV deaths or hospitalized heart failure, 31 cardiovascular deaths, 28 patients hospitalized again for heart failure, 37 patients hospitalized for any reason, 53 total admissions for heart failure, and 111 total admissions for any reason. So that's just over a median of 27 months. So huge impact on the, on the care. But this medicine, which got into the guidelines within 12 months of this publication, wasn't being utilized. And it was, I think, because there was limited experience in hospitalized acute heart failure patients, because they were excluded by protocol. They were considered too sick, too hemodynamically unstable. So what we knew was that the patients that were enrolled, there weren't very many blacks. Uh, there was a low rate of subsequent heart failure hospitalization of only 14%. So these patients were selected as stable, and arguably not the patients we would see. And you had to have been able to tolerate the highest doses of these drugs uh, for uh, in a single blind sequential uh, uh, entry before you actually got randomized. So a lot of people dropped out so you basically were selecting for those patients. And we knew nothing about the safety, tolerability, the efficacy in a broader population of patients with de novo heart failure or who had not been on RAS inhibition before, who were black patients. Or, or, uh, we knew nothing about that patient. So that was the, the population that, that we set out to study. It was this trial called Pioneer, which randomized patients hospitalized with acute dehydrated heart failure who had been stabilized hemodynamically. Um, uh, and we randomized them within 24 hours to 10 days during their initial admission between these two drugs uh, to evaluate biomarker surrogates of, uh, of efficacy, tolerability, and safety, and clinical outcomes. This was the key entry criteria. Important to, to just highlight, we focused on patients uh, who had reduced ejection fraction uh, when we know that that's only about 50% of all hospitalized heart failure patients. And you see, we took patients who we defined arguably for the first time in the literature as, as hemodynamically stable by the measures of being, having a blood pressure of at least 100 for six hours uh, and having no requirement to be on increasing doses of IV diuretics. They were, many of them, 80% were on IV diuretics, but they wouldn't have had to have an increase in the last six hours and no need for inotropes within the 24 hours. This is what these patients look like. The median ejection fraction was 24%. The median blood pressure was 118, and about a quarter of the patients had a blood pressure between 100 and 110. And these were, uh, they had evidence of, of high natriuretic peptides suggesting high wall stress. And this was our primary endpoint. Uh, as expected, we powered it for this uh, biomarker, 
uh, uh, that there was a substantial reduction in nt probe MP, which again has been very well correlated with clinical outcomes in heart failure, although not perfect, okay? And we did this because we had the paradigm results already. We knew the safety in the long term. We wanted to see the safety and, and tolerability in the short term and what it would do to, to, to uh, efficacy outcomes and clinical outcomes. We shared, we showed that there was a safe drug, that there was actually no real significant difference in terms of symptomatic hypertension, renal dysfunction, uh, angioedema, or permanent discontinuations between the two arms. If anything, uh, um, there was numerically more permanent discontinuations in angioedema in the, uh, in the uh, now form. And this was a very happy surprise um, that by starting and making this decision early in hospital, we were able, although not powered initially, to show, because of the strengths of the event, of the uh, point estimate, that we had about a 46% relative reduction in this composite of death or heart failure rehospitalization. There was only two LVADs equal in both arms and no transplants listed. So it's really heart failure rehospitalization. We then weren't really sure because this was investigator defined events. And we went back and did all this blindedly with a different group in a postdoc manner. And we showed that the absolute reduction of 12, of eight weeks of this therapy was greater than the absolute risk reduction that we should show in 27 months in the paradigm trial. So targeting these high risk patients at this point in their trajectory has an important impact. And you can see the difference uh, 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 visually. And this was really driven by a substantial reduction in the need to be rehospitalized for congestion and hyperperfusion in heart failure. It didn't matter if these patients were new patients, or old patients, they, if they were a new diagnosis of heart failure, if they were new, uh, had been on prior RAS inhibition or not, the effects were quite similar. Uh, and we had uh, collected, um, to everyone's credit, a lot of information which we're starting to pour over around the mechanisms underlying this, that there was a substantial reduction that started early in differences in biomarkers of, of uh, myocardial necrosis as well as wall stress. And what we showed in this was we then gave everyone sclerovalsartan after the, blind, the blinded therapy was over. Everyone uh, got uh, uh, sclerovalsartan from eight to 12 weeks and wanted to know, could you transition people? What was the effect of the transition? So the good news was these nt p levels reduced to the same level after 12 weeks, even if you started late. But you can't catch up events, right? Even you just stabilized them by starting them. Um, but the curves can, didn't continue to diverge, but you couldn't, for those patients that had early events, you couldn't you know, go turn back the, the clock of the time. So then I'm gonna end with just a few kind of uh, blue sky comments. Um, this is something that I, I've gotten into uh, in my new roles and also because I've just had a lot of interest over the years as a, as a, as a basic science wannabe. Um, this is our understanding of, uh, of how much uh, is out there around non-coding RNAs. So we know that about 3% uh, of, of mRNAs code proteins, and the rest are small microRNAs or these long non-coding RNAs. Um, and we don't know anything about them, but we know that they have an impact. Why would they exist and what, what, what their role is? Uh, somewhere in the range of over 30,000 segments. Um, and so I put this up here just to give you a sense of we are only beginning to understand what we don't know. Um, and we need to learn how to apply this information, um, uh, at whether it can help us in defining phenotypically the patients better uh, and maybe uh, finding new therapies. And in my perspective, I see my role today to kind of remove the heterogeneity in care, to make sure that we use what we know what we, what we need to do, we do it well across the board, until we find, and people maybe in this audience find, the new therapies that hopefully can transition into computational models that can point to point of care uh, for patients that are, that are uh, uh, based on mechanistic insights uh, and that may be delivered uh, in a precise manner to each and every individual. This is the, the nirvana. Um, and I think this is where we have to go, but we're a long way from there. And at the end of the day, 
what I see is missed opportunities that I'm trying to work uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to minimize. Uh, we have this uh, poorly managed insights uh, from basic science that we may not take full advantage of. We have evidence that's created, but that's been poorly used. I hope I've shared with you a little bit of that. We have care that we deliver that's poorly captured. Um, and so we have all these leakage opportunities that I think are missed opportunities lead to increasing waste and harm and reduce the patient experience and the outcomes. And I think part of people like me, my, my, I see my responsibility is trying to manage this so that many of you can focus on the top end and help us develop new therapies. So with that, I'd like to just summarize. It's really been a pleasure um, to give you some perspective on acute heart failure. I think it remains devastating. Uh, it's arguably financial impact is at a macro level globally. Um, we have a lot to, uh, to learn. It spans the novo patients to chronically uh, uh, worsening patients. We know that we should be uh, uh, doing better at the pre-discharge medication initiation level, uh, and that we know that short-term therapies uh, are unlikely to provide long-term long benefits. Uh, I think that's what we've learned from the trials to date. Uh, I gave you some data from the recently published Pioneer data that I was part of to give you a sense of how I've kind of approached this construct of doing better with our known chronic oral therapies and making sure that we know how to use them effectively so they're used more frequently in these types of patients. And I think we need to continue to work <laughs> to target better implementation of these therapies and to, and to develop new ones uh, into the future. So thanks for your attention. Maybe because of reduction in wall stress uh, and, uh, and this troponin 
issue that I shared with you here that is that is maybe underlying these uh, clinical events. So the AHA, oh, I don't know how many years ago, initiated this get with the guidelines program to try to tackle the issue by focusing on hospitals so that uh, it figured to reach, uh, get patients started on medications like beta blockers before discharge. The data suggests that that hasn't really worked all that well, given that we're still not using common drugs that were invented 30 years ago. What's the what are we what 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 are we need to do differently in terms of getting all those states with those big red dots yeah. on them um, to get with you know to get on board with uh, studies like Pioneer? So, right, so using I, carbamol. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a, a great question and one that I don't have a particular uh, one, one single answer. I think we have to have a better understanding of social determinants of health and how they're interacting with the decisions we make. Uh, um, uh, understanding, um, uh, developing new delivery care paths, pathways that allow us to address those issues over a, a, a shorter period of time. Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, for many of you in the room who are clinicians, you know that the uh, what's driving sometimes behaviors uh, may not be necessarily evidence based, uh, uh, um, and so uh, making it easy. That's the media to make it easy for clinicians to do the right thing. We want to do the right thing, okay? But now I think we are have been leaving this on the backs of saying, well, it's this physician or this group that does this right or wrong, when we really need to more fundamentally go back and say, what's the system of care? How can we modify a care so it make so we actually make it easier for people to do the right thing? That's my, you know, politically incorrect approach to that answer because I don't have a better one. Bobby, you were coming. So first off, welcome to campus. And I would say, in part, the answer to the question is vote differently. You look at the map; it looks like the electoral college. And if you and if you look at what's happened over the last few years, the states that have expanded Medicaid under the ACA, their health outcomes are improving. And the states that haven't, their health outcomes is doing what Eric showed. So, so that that's one answer. But my my question for Eric is that uh, I was at the European meetings a few weeks ago, and the hottest thing of the week was. Uh, the STL2 inhibitor right. and chronic heart failure. What do you think in acute heart failure? Is there any reason to believe mechanistically that might be different than uh, than chronic heart failure? And I don't. I don't believe that it would be mechanistically different. I think what we need to understand before it's used commonly is whether it can be uh, it can be given safely, uh, and and what is the right time and how do you integrate it with what we know. So you know, I'm very interested in, in understanding how um, we uh, we understand how do we use these two new drugs available to us potentially the same way. Now, I think that the glitazones have to do a little bit more work. Um, we have it's never been tested in under these conditions. Um, they need to probably do that study um, that, that mostly to understand how how do you deliver it and is it safe. Um, not let I, I'm not really going to put them keep them. Show to make them show me that it's beneficial because I think if you do the kind of trial they did with DAP HF, I think it's out there. Um, but I think how we deliver the therapy um, is a big deal, and I think the worst thing that can happen is if we willy nilly apply these things and maybe in, there's an interaction we're not fully uh, understanding. Now, John McMurray showed, I think, a, 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 there was a, a, a good number of patients um, in the DAP HF trial that were on Sigurvalsardin. There were, there were some. Um, and there was no evidence of any heterogeneity effect in that population. Again, in a chronic patient population where blood pressures are going to be higher, and there's, we were, there were these, these run-in phases, too, that they use that I have to say I'm, I'm not a big fan of because it, it takes away the generalizability of the data to the patients. Yes, thank you, Eric, for an amazing talk. Can you comment on the role of echo, maybe for physiologic-guided volume assessments, for example, if it has a role in well, that's a great question, Francois. I mean, I, I think it does if you know how to use it, um, now, uh, uh, which I know you do. But I'm, I'm, I'm say, I, I say that uh, tongue in cheek because I know a lot of people don't. I mean, I, I would say that even among my heart failure colleagues, um, and I'm not, it, whatever institution, I, I can talk about both. Um, many of the questions that I receive are going to be, "What's the EF?" Which is arguably, frankly, meaningless. Uh, I mean, I'm more interested in what's the volume. Um, what is uh, what? What do I know about the filling parameters? And there's a lot of information 
and there's a lot of phenomapping mapping uh, uh, that we need to apply with that data that we don't we don't use. So I, I'm actually not worried about whether it can have value. I'm I'm worried about do people even know how to use it? And I think um, so. There was. Um, there, there, it, there it was initially evidence that if you got an echo in the hospital, you actually had a better outcome. And that was thought to be translatable through an improvement in your ability to start <coughs> evidence-based medical therapy earlier. That now has been repeated, that, uh, that kind of study, 20 years later. We, me and Adrian Hernandez did that study, actually, uh, uh, many years back. And the, the evidence here is, is not as, now it doesn't seem to be as, as strong. And I think it's because the level of care has increased, but, but um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not necessarily as worried about whether ECHO provides value. I think it's that people don't know how to use it. Yeah. Hey, Harry, hey. welcome. Yeah. Thank you. It's nice to see you outside yeah. of the study section. <laughs> but one question I'm intrigued by the, the transform heart failure where you're comparing torsamide and furosemide, when neither one I don't think has any mortality benefit or has not shown that's, that. That's right. So what will be the ultimate outcome of the trial? Well, the, 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 You've, you hit on a very important point, and I, I congratulate to that, because you're right. There is no evidence in terms of an outcome it's like uh, uh, that we have with, with decongestive therapies, because we don't have an alternative. I mean, we don't have, uh, at least to date, maybe the, 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 the glitazones and pseudolazardin will be that alternative in the future. But right now, the use in the uh, transition from hospital to home of loop diuretics exceeds 85%. So you can't, you know, arguably we weren't able to, we weren't going to be able to randomize patients to the third arm, which would have been placebo, um, because that would have been not pragmatic. It, it wouldn't be doable. Right? So what we did instead was try to ask the question, well, we have multiple generic options that are both $4 in the Walmart pharmacy in most places, and we have some biological data and some meta-analytic data suggests a benefit in favor of one or the other, and they're pharmacodynamically and pharmacodynamically different, let's at least know which one of the two we should use. But you're right, I would love to be able to step back um, and ask that question, but it fundamentally is unfeasible based on how we practice medicine right now. Well, that's how we think, uh, Eric. Stanford University.